Hey guys, Danatix here, back with another Cyberpunk 2077 video. This time breaking down most of the previews we got from journalists who recently had the honor of playing 16 hours of the game. Journalists such as IGN, GameSpot, GamesRadar, GameStar, and PC Gamer. I'll be covering impressions, size, graphics, quests, NPCs, boobs, relationships, dildos, street cred, perks, resetting, the enemy AI and their reverse bullet time, crafting, and much, much more. What do you want from me? <laughs> to subscribe. There are a lot of you that watch my videos and aren't subscribed. Help me out by hitting that button. Trust me, you're gonna want my guides, gameplay and info coming up and you can always unsub when not interested in RPG content anymore. So it took IGN roughly six hours to reach the game's opening title card, as in to finish the Life Path prologue, and I think it'll take people anywhere from four to seven hours. It's gonna be a big game, not for those who wanna rush through, but for those who want a rich RPG experience. This is emphasized more when IGN mentions they got to play 16 hours and felt like it only scratched the surface. IGN says, At first, I thought 16 hours was an almost excessive amount of time for a preview. Not that I was complaining, but Cyberpunk 2077 is a surprisingly slow burn with an immense amount of options and depth. I only truly got a grasp of its pace and structure by the end of that first day and spent the second sitting onto what 2020's most anticipated game actually felt like to play. So he mentions that as soon as you get past the prologue, the world opens up and you could spend days before you even glance at the main quest line as there's a list of side quests so long you could get lost. Something of note is that you can travel to anywhere right after the prologue. None of the city is restricted and when you enter a new district, you get a call from the local fixer, which can set you on multiple missions and even do things like help you acquire loot and cars for a price. GamesRadar praised the game for giving them the most organic and close to human interactions they've possibly ever experienced in a game. They say, if you want to talk to someone, you just go up to them. Gone is the press X to interact prompt for the resonance of Night City, instead you're given options for your openers and then you're in. It's very limited in terms of cutscenes too, instead focusing on offering up interactive conversations that you can freely control, opting to pick up on something happening elsewhere in a room amid conversation if you wish. They mentioned that they were asked to pick up their eddies for a job well done via a phone call with a fixer. They forgot. Later on, they were involved with that fixer during a separate mission and was able to bring up their cash during that conversation. Little details like this will make the game so incredibly replayable. GameSpot mentioned a few story spoilers for one of the missions, specifically the one you see in the 2019 Deep Dive video, so I won't mention them here. The impression though was that they loved the choice that was offered and both the outcomes they selected didn't go exactly the way they hoped. No matter what they were doing, even some side quests, they felt their choices left a mark on Night City, even if it's just developing a relationship. One such relationship will be Judy, who sends you on a mission to search for her missing friend, a sex worker who is a doll. A doll uses implants to give up control of their body to an AI to fulfill customers' desires, their memory is then wiped. The quest is multi-stage and takes you to all parts of the city, which we saw in the Night City Wire special. GameSpot says, Judy even accompanies you in the later part of the quest, providing another gun as you scour the hideout for scavengers, a gang who harvest cybernetic parts from victims. While playing through the quest that concerned Judy, I got a real sense that the way I treated her, both in regards to her stake in the investigation and her personal feelings, were affecting my V's relationship with her. That pays off in later interactions create a bond and Judy sends messages to your phone to see how you're doing and to check in on some further story developments. In turn, this unlocks more story with her, but it seems if you blow her off and treat her poorly, those options won't be available to you. You can bud relationships with many people in Night City, but the most important character is Johnny Silverhand, who CD Projekt Red describe as your co-protagonist. The biochip problem is a ticking clock. It's slowly taking over V's body and replacing their personality with Johnny's. So here's a question. Is helping Johnny just hastening your demise? I feel the way CD Projekt Red writes dark stories, there'll be a lot of this under the surface. GamesRadar says, It's hard to over-exaggerate just how full this world is. The map is a candy store of opportunities, whether it's live crimes in progress, rides to buy, gigs to pick up, side quests to explore, a bit of shopping or indulging in one of the local joy toys. There's almost too much to do in Night City. 
GameStar mentions the emotional depth of some of these side quests. Okay, you think hunting cyber psychos would be an open and closed case. They're psychopaths that have just over modified their bodies to the point of psychosis. But after ravaging through the psycho's mail, after the obvious boss fight, you learn that he was an army veteran who first lost his job and then his health insurance. Nobody wanted to help this particular cyber psycho anymore, especially when he began to develop delusions. The game is going to find ways to target your heartstrings. We know what kind of side quests to expect, but every source that played the title said the main storyline is gripping, engaging, and has them extremely invested. PC Gamer says, there's stuff in here to rival The Witcher 3's best quests, and I was pleasantly surprised how much of an emotional punch the story packs. Games Radar says, an optional objective in the mission may involve setting up an alternate meeting or simply involve calling another character to check in, but all of these have a potential to send objectives spinning in wildly different directions or uncover a secret hidden subplot that could influence your future choices. And it's here, deep in the grey in between, that the real intrigue into Cyberpunk 2077's branching narrative gets into your psyche like the biochips that fuel these cybernetically enhanced individuals. Though PC Gamer continues, the map is covered in a mess of icons because it's a modern open world game after all, but most of them are question marks, meaning you won't know what they are until you travel there. This makes time exploring the world more meaningful and surprising rather than just feeling like you're hoovering up icons, which is the impression that I got when I was playing Assassin's Creed Valhalla. It was a huge open world, a lot to do, but I knew exactly what the icons were. A gripe IGN had was the quest line was hard to manage. He would have appreciated more descriptions on quests like rewards and difficulty, but as CD Projekt Red have stated, this is intentional. They don't want you selecting missions based on rewards. They want you to naturally do them and be surprised what you earn based on your choices. Do you see a quest giver with a particular iron on his hip? Well, maybe he gives it to you at the end of the quest line, or maybe you have to kill him to get it. IGN would have also appreciated if the map and waypoints worked better, and that's definitely something I think needs to be done well. As I mentioned, there are a ton of quests you'll be collecting, and not having a good way to manage them will be a problem. Though this is something CD Projekt Red can fix with patches, or we can fix if modding becomes available. IGN says, Thankfully, one of my favorite things to do in Cyberpunk 2077 didn't involve the menu at all. Just drive. Simply put, Night City is stunning, and I don't think I've ever seen another video game city even close to it in scope or style. It's gorgeous, rich in detail, and with a verticality and scale that's genuinely amazing, all the while still feeling like it could be a real place. IGN says they haven't seen anything like it before, that its verticality and scale is breathtaking. They rather drive places than fast travel, as cars make it relatively fast to get around and the scenery was worth the extra time it took. That being said, they also mentioned that combat is not part of the travel, as in traveling from A to B won't be necessarily involving fighting someone. You can twist and involve yourself in the many, many combat encounters around, but you can also completely avoid them. They attributed this to more of a GTA style than a Fallout style, even though the gameplay is more RPG like the Witcher and Fallout series. GameStar mentions, even, even though I see a lot of people worried about it, that the streets in the city are in no way deserted. In the PC version at least, at the highest level of detail. The streets and the bars are teeming with NPCs where they should be teeming. Obviously, there are a lot less in a Badlands coffee shop than in the city center. Yes, there are also more NPCs on a high-end PC than in the latest gameplay trailer for the Xbox Series X, so it seems like it's most likely a resource thing, which is understandable considering the scale of the game. They also note that you can't kill children or even aim at them, something that the modding community will no doubt change. Anyone that shoots or kills people in the city centers will need to deal with the police, but law enforcement seems more relaxed the more wild the areas get. They also noted that NPCs react less than they would to things like theft than they do in a game like GTA. IGN does say that the combat is one of the weaker points, but only when compared to how glorious everything else is. Mentions that enemies are hard, and it's not a straight FPS. I attribute this to what CD Projekt Red have said multiple times, that it's an RPG first. In RPGs you start fairly weak, but notice you power up as you build your character. You want an RPG power fantasy of ripping through minions when you've gotten all those juicy perks. More on perks in my last video. 
So all this is emphasized in their statement, combat didn't really start impressing me until midway through my second day, once I had unlocked a few more abilities and found a strategy I enjoyed. But by the end of my playtime, I had a powerful rifle that could charge up shots and shoot through walls, as well as a legendary katana. I would sneak into a room, use a hack to reveal enemy positions, then get behind a wall and pick them off based on their hologram outlines alone, and if any ran at me, I would swap to my sword and cut off their head. He then praised the game's combat for having so much choice. All the different kinds of combat options, stealth, hacking and using the body stat to bust through doors. They can see how things open up and smiled ear to ear. PC Gamer mentioned just how much they loved melee combat, saying, This lures the sniper away from his post, and then when his back is turned, I introduced him to the Black Unicorn, which is a legendary katana. I'm actually a little troubled at how much I loved using this sword and the squishy, whippy sounds it makes when I swing it at people. When it comes to character progression, GameStar mentions that you can reset perk points for 100,000 credits, so it won't be something you take lightly, but it's something you can do. They recommend you decide what kind of playstyle you want before investing since you can't reset your attribute points. I like this as it encourages replayability. Even cyberware is expensive, so you can't just buy them all to experiment. They also mention that street cred opens up more options as it levels, as in more quests, more items at vendors that are locked behind levels, and specifically, the best cyber implants able to be bought require a high street cred level. Chrome legs with a high jump won't be just sold to any kid on the street. You get street cred from quests, even side quests. They mention they like the tech sniper rifle they found because it could be charged up and instantly kill weaker gang goons with a single shot through walls. It even marked targets behind walls with an outline. They tried their hand at a non-lethal play too by modding their weapons with non-lethal rounds and using one of the non-lethal melee weapons, a pipe wrench. Yeah, I, I don't know how a pipe wrench is non-lethal, but just bear with me. In terms of gameplay, they didn't see a difference between lethal and non-lethal as stun enemies don't get back up again, but some NPCs will react differently. In terms of NPCs, they found the AI quite decent. Melee will storm up, range will even duck behind cover and peek their guns over to spray in your general direction, which can be surprisingly deadly. What is most interesting though is enemy net runners, and they can use abilities like the Kereznikov, the bullet time booster where you have access to as well. It basically makes them appear to move super quickly so they're harder to hit, a sort of reverse bullet time. They can also hack you with an attack that overheats you and causes thermal damage. To fend off the attack, you have to get out of their field of vision, which includes cameras and enemies they're linked to. So the way crafting works is you dismantle loot and collect common, rare, epic and legendary materials. With the appropriate blueprints, you can create items of those qualities. Items include weapons, clothing, mods, grenades, healing aids, demons and even cyberware. During their 15 hours, they were able to construct weapons and healing sprays, but since we have seen grenade perks in the tech tree, we can expect some legendary explosives later on. You can also say find the gun you like and keep upgrading it along with you. You can craft at any time and don't need to travel to a workbench. Logically, this might not work for you, but it wouldn't be fun if you needed to travel places to dismantle and clean up your inventory. When you need downtime though, PC Gamer says, Click the TV on in V's apartment and you can sit and watch hours of news reports, lurid entertainment shows, and a channel that plays non-stop commercials. Cyberpunk creator Mike Pondsmith even turns up as a DJ on one of the radio stations. Or you can seek out relationships. GameSpot goes into detail about how you can get busy in Night City. The easiest way to get your rocks off is to seek out sex workers. You've seen these in the Night City Wire special. They have an icon of a slightly parted pair of lips and are found in certain districts like Kabuki. You can pick up workers of any gender. GameSpot says, Finding and hiring a sex worker goes about how you'd expect, with a quick discussion and a small transaction of Night City's currency, eddies, to trigger a sexy cutscene. Players familiar with City Project Red's last big RPG, The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, will have an idea of what to expect in terms of boning down, although the scene is a bit more involved and a bit more graphic than what Geralt gets up to. Protagonist V and his partner slam the ham in a number of positions, all played from a first person perspective, and there was a fair amount of full frontal female nudity and moaning in the scene. Just as a side, there are a lot of boobs to see in Night City. 
So the encounters are optional and don't seem to incur any benefits, at least as far as they could see, but maybe they were too focused on the boobs. GameSpot had another encounter during the duty mission line with a doll in the cloud's brothel, but I won't spoil what happens. I will mention though that a GameSpot employee was scarred by a huge steroid loving animal gangster chasing him with a sledgehammer screaming that his dick was hard. It also mentioned that there are a ton of dildos around the world that you can break down. In gang hideouts there are just a ton laying around. They aren't concerned at all with dildo privacy, though you can buy the more dangerous ones inside the shops. Of course, developing an actual lasting relationship with the character will require more work than just handing over money or a dildo. So a lot of positive and a few negative when it comes to Cyberpunk. Another issue were the bugs. A few players had an instance where the UI disappeared or dialogue didn't play, which lends to the fact that the delay was to clean up all that was definitely needed to be cleaned up. The overall consensus is that each journalist outlet that got to play went away craving more and some didn't want to leave. As of right now, it seems like Cyberpunk 2077 is going to be a truly amazing game. So thanks for watching guys. I appreciate all of you and the support you've been sending my way. So if you like this video, shoot it a like and let me know if what you heard is positive or not. My competition to win a copy of the game is still running and I've been giving them out to subscribers consistently for the past year, so check that out. For everything cyberpunk, keep your eyes on this channel. Ciao friends.